Hey everybody. Welcome to <laughs> Welcome to Proofs and Goofs. The show where we do a little math and sing a little song. This week's episode Linear Programming. I hope you have a good time. Maybe even learn something new. Now, odds are if you've taken an algorithms class in school before, you've probably encountered the concept of linear programming. And that's because linear programs are essentially the most general form of optimization problems. All your other classic algorithms, like finding the maximal flow over a network, the optimal fractional set cover, computing a correlated equilibrium in a game, all of these are essentially special types of linear programs. But right, they all fall under this big umbrella of, of type of problem known as linear program and understanding uh, you know the structure of linear programs and how to solve them and what they're like is going to be good for building intuition on understanding all of these other uh, optimization problems. So what is a linear program? I'm glad you asked. A linear program essentially has two pieces to it. There is a direction, which we call the objective, and there's a collection of walls that we call constraints. And the whole goal of the optimization problem is essentially we want to find a point as far in this direction as possible, but constrained by these walls. So, uh, for example, you can think of all the points along this yellow line as getting a score of one. These are all score two, score three, score four, five, six. And right, our goal is going to be finding the point of highest score that is within this box, right? So in this case, it's this uh, corner right here. We label it the magenta star gets a score of five. So essentially every single linear program has this kind of evil twin or misunderstood twin known as the dual linear program, okay? And duals have very interesting properties, right? Like they uh, have essentially the same optimal value as the primal, but they get there in a totally different way. And yeah, it's like really interesting to understand why do linear programs come in these pairs. Uh, and it's important to understand this for algorithms and stuff, right? So for example, the problem of finding the maximal flow over a network is equivalent to the problem of finding the minimum cut of that network. Uh, I don't want to get into exactly what this means, but rest assured, these are two pretty different uh, algorithmic problems, but they are equivalent, essentially, because of linear programming duality. So uh, let's talk about duality. Let's try to understand what it is. Uh, you know, you maybe at some point in your life encountered the formula for how you construct the dual linear program, giving the primal. Uh, you know, you gotta you gotta swap these bad boys around, and you know, transpose this guy, and uh, swap this max to a min, and uh, you know, maybe you memorized this formula at some point. It didn't make any sense to you, but uh, the goal of today is we're gonna make this all make sense. And we're gonna do it with a little game theory and the help of our main man Lagrange. Okay, so Lagrange came up with the following really interesting perspective on what are referred to as constrained optimization problems. Okay. Linear programming is an example of constrained optimization. We are trying to optimize, you know, choose a point optimally in this direction, but we are constrained by some set of walls. So Lagrange comes up with the following idea. He says, I'm going to let you choose a point anywhere on the plane. Doesn't matter. You can ignore the constraints. Go wild. But here's the problem. If you happen to choose a point that is outside of the walls, you're going to lose the game. Okay. So I'm going to explain to you what that game is in just a second. But to recap, you know, in terms of uh, this op this uh, uh, direction, we came up with this scoring system of how far you are in this direction. Uh, so, you know, like this magenta star here gets a, a score of six. We can also essentially give this magenta star a score in terms of each of the walls, right? So we could say that uh, for all the points exactly along the red wall, you get a red score of zero. These get a red score of one, one step within the wall. These get a red score of two. And similarly, the points outside of the wall get negative scores. So these get a score, red score of negative one. These get a red score of negative two. So this magenta star gets a red score of two. Likewise, it gets a blue score of negative two. It's two steps outside of the blue wall. And a green score of negative one. Okay. So the following is the game. It's going to be a two-player game between the star guy and the multiplier guy. Okay. So first, the star guy goes, and he chooses a star. From that star, you get a collection of points. You get the point in terms of the objective value, and you get the points in terms of all the constraints. Then the multiplier guy comes along, and he chooses a multiplier for each of the walls. Okay, These are going to be greater than or equal to zero. And then essentially, 
you're going to multiply these together and add them all up. So you get this value V, which is essentially, you know, the objective score plus essentially summing over all of the walls of the, the wall score times the multiplier. Okay. And essentially the star player's goal is to make V as large as possible. And the multiplier player's goal is to make V as small as possible. You could think of this as, you know, player two is going to pay player one V dollars or, you know, if V is negative. It'll go the other way. So, right. That's the goal of the game. So here's the thing. Player two, one can go ahead and choose a star outside of the walls, get a pretty big uh, yellow value, try to make some money. But the problem is, if I choose a point that has any negative score on any of the walls, right? Like if we get a negative two blue score, that's going to enable the multiplier player to choose a super large Y2 value in this example. You know, I can choose a million billion or infinity, right? And then that's going to make V negative infinity and player two is going to win infinity dollars. Not a good look for player one, right? So that's the thing, right? Like player one is going to have to kind of be forced to get a non-negative score for all of the walls um, in order to not lose infinity dollars. And that is essentially equivalent to saying that player one is constrained to be within the walls. Um, and we essentially have recovered this game that it gets the exact same optimal value as the original linear program. This guy is going to essentially just try to make the yellow score as big as possible, um, all the while keeping all the wall scores non-negative. Okay, so now we have linear programming as a game, and the whole idea of linear programming duality comes from the following fact about two-player zero-sum games. Essentially, this is a two-player zero-sum game. We have two players going, and what one guy wins is what one guy loses. And the thing about two-player zero-sum games is that it is better to go second, no matter what. What do I mean by this? Let's talk about rock, paper, scissors, okay? In rock, paper, scissors, you know, it's a two-player zero-sum game, and we have both guys going at the same time. We, you know, we both choose our option simultaneously. But what if we did it a little different, all right? So let's play rock, paper, scissors, me and you, but I'll go first, and then you go second. All right? Bang. That's my choice. Now it's your turn. Odds are, you probably went with rock because you got to see what I did. You get to respond in the best possible way to my action and you're going to win the game, right? This is the whole idea, right? Like if I have to give up my strategy first, you're going to be able to make the best response possible to my strategy and you're going to be at an advantage. Similarly, if you went first in rock, paper, scissors, you'd probably lose too. Anyways, so what is the lesson from this? Essentially... If we go back to our linear program, you know, we were able to formulate it as this game between the multiplier guy and the star guy, right? And we said, you know, okay, if the multiplier guy goes second, responding to the star guy best as possible, we get this game that is essentially equivalent to the original linear program. And the idea behind the duel is essentially, what if we make the multiplier guy go first? What if the multiplier guy has to choose his Y1 to Y3? And then the star guy gets to respond to the observed Y values and, you know, gets this value for V, right? So what can we say about this game? Okay, first things first. If the star guy is going to respond with a point that is within the box, then all of these, uh, you know, wall scores are going to be non-negative. And what this means is that essentially, uh, you know, if this guy, if the multiplier guy chose these Ys to be very large values, He's essentially uh, just wasting money, you know, because, you know, uh, the score guy can always make uh, all of these wall scores positive, or sorry, the star guy can always make all of these wall scores positive, and therefore you're just kind of wasting money. So in an intuitive sense, the wall guy, or the multiplier guy, rather, sorry, is going to be trying to make the Ys as small as possible. However, if he gets a little greedy and he makes the Ys too small, he's going to be in trouble. Because if you make the Ys super, super small, maybe really close to zero, then essentially the star guy is barely penalized at all for going outside of the walls. Essentially, I can choose a star that's super far in this direction and, you know, maybe get super negative blue and green wall scores, but get a huge yellow score, right? But then the thing is, when you multiply it all together, because you got greedy and you chose your Ys to be super small, uh, essentially this objective is going to have very large value. Similar to the last game, uh, you know, essentially when uh, the star guy got greedy when he was going first and chose something outside of the wall, the multiplier player was able to blow up the game to infinity. 
And similarly, if the multiplier guy gets greedy and makes his uh, multipliers too small, uh, then the star guy is going to end up being able to blow up the game to infinity and win infinity dollars, right? Okay, so what can we say about this game? So we have player two who's trying to, you know, optimize his choice of the Y1 to Y3, trying to make it kind of as small as possible in some direction. But if he gets too greedy and crosses some sort of threshold, then he, the game is going to blow up and he's going to lose infinity dollars. Seems a little familiar, doesn't it? Well, that's exactly because this is also another linear program, right? And this is, in fact, what is the dual linear program to the original. If we make the multiplier guy go first, uh, then, uh, you know, we get another linear program. So here's the thing, right? We have these two linear programs. We have this linear program that comes from when the star guy goes first, and we have this linear program that comes from when the multiplier guy goes first. And essentially, we know that uh, when the multiplier guy goes first, essentially the, the total outcome of the game is going to be uh, at least larger, right? Um, you know, the star guy is trying to maximize something. So when he goes first, he's at a disadvantage and the game is going to be smaller, the, the value of V at the end. And when the multiplier guy goes first, he's trying to minimize something. So he's at a disadvantage. So it's going to be large. So this is known as weak duality. Uh, you know, these are these two linear programs. And the statement of weak duality is essentially that we know that the second linear program is always going to have greater than or equal to value of the first linear program. But we can say something even stronger. And that is known as strong duality. And that says that with optimal play, so if you go back to these two games and, you know, instead of, you know, the star guy just choosing some sort of star haphazardly, if he chooses the star to, to you know, with optimal perfect precision, uh, and similarly, if the multiplier guy makes perfect decisions, then these two linear programs or these two games are going to have equal value and therefore the two linear programs have equal value. This is known as strong duality. Okay, let's go into this a little bit. So let's go back to rock, paper, scissors again, right? Let's do the same thing where, you know, I'm going to go first and then you're going to respond going second. But this time I'm going to let myself choose mixed strategies. So what that means is I'm going to let myself select a probability distribution in addition to just choosing the pair of strategies. Okay, ready? Three, two, one, bang. I have chosen rock, paper, and scissors, each with one third probability. So there you go. I've told you my entire strategy. It's going to be, I'm going to, you know, roll a three-sided dice and essentially go rock, paper, or scissors uh, based on the outcome of that. You get to know my exact strategy. Now make your response. Oh, that's right. There's no real way to exploit this strategy. Even though I've gone first and given up the goods, you essentially still don't have a good way of beating my strategy. Because I've played perfectly, according to the mini-max equilibrium of this game, um, essentially, even though I've gone first, I'm not at a disadvantage. So this is this idea uh, coming from this guy, Von Neumann, looking real, looking real fine in this photo here. So it's essentially that, right, in a two-player zero-sum game, with perfect play, going first is the same as going second. This is known as the mini-max equilibrium of the game. Uh, yeah. And essentially, how this manifests in the star game is, you know, we have these two guys. And essentially, there are these two perfect strategies in this game, which is the optimal star and the optimal multipliers. And the point is that if the star guy goes first and he chooses the optimal star, then the multiplier guy could choose the optimal multipliers. And this would be a best response to the star. This would be one of tied with the possible decisions to get the smallest possible V value. And similarly, with these exact same values, if the multiplier guy went first, this is one of the star guy's best response. So it's this pair of, of, of multiplier and star, wherein essentially, uh, no matter who goes first, if the other guy responds with the same thing, it's one of the best responses. Um, and, uh, you know, for example, in rock, paper, scissors, this would be both guys playing one third, one third, one third. Um, and yeah, this is really interesting. And what this proves is that the optimal value for both the primal and dual linear program are exactly identical, right? So here's the thing, right? You know, if this guy chooses a star, one last little observation for you, and, you know, he gets these scores based on the star he's chosen. And then, you know, the, the other guy responds with the best response uh, multipliers. We have the following fact, right? So the V value that comes out of this is this. And that means that because the red score on the optimal star was greater than zero, this means that the optimal Y1 star value has to be zero, right? Because we know that like Y star, <laughs> I'm using star both times, a little, little, little bit of an abuse of notation, but bear with me. So the optimal Y1 is a best response to this 5500 vector. That means that this optimal Y vector is going to be 
essentially one of the potential y vectors that is going to minimize this value of v, right? So that means that this y1 has to be equal to zero. Because if it wasn't zero, he could do better by setting y1 to zero, which would reduce the value of v. The y2 optimal and y3 optimal values might not be zero, because again, they get multiplied by zero. So to obtain the optimal value, you could kind of go a little crazy, but uh, you know, by y1, we are forced to set it to zero. And similarly, if, um, you know, because we know that the star, the magenta star is an optimal response to these, uh, you know, y1, y2, y3 multipliers, that means that for every optimal multiplier that's not zero, we're going to have to choose a star that's exactly on the wall in order to uh, optimize our goal. Because if we weren't on the wall, we could take a slight step towards the wall and get a better V value. So this is the idea of complementary slackness, okay? And this is just this one thing I wanted to introduce a little bit at the end. Don't worry about it too much. But yeah, essentially, you know, uh, uh, going back to the formulation of linear programs as a game makes complementary slackness make a lot more sense. Oh god damn, it's a linear program, what am I gonna do? Oh I feel so clamped by your linear hands, but I'm gonna follow through. Push towards the objective, I expected it to wind. And through some introspection, I did find the reality is a duality our objectives are just our constraints and i grow weary of the brutality when we're gonna realize that it's all a game don't you know that it all starts with a little lagrangian it's gonna take everything you've got, every last mitochondrion, in due time with an open mind and a little practice. You just might conceptualize complementary slackness because the reality is a duality. Our objectives are just our constraints And I grow weary of the brutality When we're gonna realize that we're all the same Oh, I know you try To grow and optimize just know when the walls collide Oh, I'll be right by your side Because the reality is a duality Our objectives are just our constraints and I grow weary of the brutality When we're gonna realize that it's all a game When we're gonna realize that we're all the same Thanks for watching. See you next week. Uh, blah, blah, blah.